The first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Please stand for the Gospel reading. The Holy Gospel according to Luke chapter 5, beginning from verse 1 to 11. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats, left there by the fishermen, who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water, and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. This is the Gospel of Christ. Um, Yeah, it's wonderful to be here and wonderful to have an opportunity to share um, from the Word of God as we gather together. When there's two or three gathered, um, Jesus is here with us, and I think that's wonderful. And I I kind of want to echo what Fraser was saying, is that I do feel like there's some seeds of something here, really excited by the potential of having uh, an evening worship service. So let's open in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you that you are here with us now. We thank you for the opportunity we have to hear your word to us, and we pray that you would give us open hearts to hear what you are saying to us this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wonderful. So I've just um, come out of two years of training for ordination. So um, I went and did some study in the UK, and then I came back and I did my final year of study um, based at St. John's College, which is in Meadowbank, um, beautiful grounds over that side of Auckland. And we moved in on site, so we lived um, on the college grounds, and we lived next to the community garden, which is why I have this picture on the screen. Um, This isn't actually a picture of the community garden, but um, it was like this when we moved in. And it was a garden that was started by some of the students and spouses that were there. And they had a real vision to bring the community together while gardening. Um, It was an opportunity to engage in some aspects of care of creation, which is one of our marks of mission as an Anglican church. Um, And also an opportunity to engage in, in the many biblical metaphors that there are around seeds and planting and growth. Um, And so this garden was commissioned as an important part of the community life, and we moved into a flat that overlooked the garden, so we could look out our lounge window into this garden each day. And when we moved in, it was beautiful. There was 
beans growing and strawberries and potatoes and silver beet. Um, a couple of days after we moved in, we were gifted all this broccoli that had just come from the garden. So it was um, just a really lovely place. And um, what they would do is have the community come together quite regularly and work together to till the soil and harvest the vegetables and plant the new things that needed to be planted. So it was a really cool part of college life. Well, we moved in a few months before the end of 2020, and then at the end of 2020, some of the key people who were involved in the establishment of that garden um, moved on because they'd finished their time at college. And what I saw happen over the year 2021 was actually a really sad, slow decline of this garden that I looked out my window of. Initially, there were a few people who tried to pick up the work involved in maintaining this garden. But then, of course, 2021 was just a really challenging year. Um, and it was a challenging year for the, uh, for the college when we had all the lockdowns. We also had a big review that went on um, in the college. And basically, the garden got forgotten. Um, and it was almost like as if the community had lost the vision of this garden and they'd lost the motivation to maintain it. And so by the time I moved out um, at the end of last year, it was just a mess. It was an overgrown, I don't know, weeds, everything. <laughs> uh, and there was just so much work that needed to be done to get it back into working order, but um, it was just not had not been prioritised and all the other things that were going on. And as I reflected on this um, image of the garden, the story of the garden, I just wondered if this was a picture of how we might, a picture that we might relate to as a church community at the moment. Because we've had a really difficult two years. We've been living through a global pandemic and that's caused all sorts of challenges. I'm sure we've all had our individual challenges within that. And as a church community, um, it's had a massive impact on us. We haven't been able to gather together to worship for months during the lockdowns. Um, and still now we have um, restrictions on us. We still have some who can't gather with us to worship. And we still have restrictions on the numbers of people we can have at services and how we can run our services and who can attend what services. We have um, restrictions on whether we can offer or we can't offer hospitality. Um, and there's restrictions on all the other programs we run as a church as well. And it just feels like we've taken some big blows as a church community, and we're living through this really difficult time. And I wonder whether we maybe feel a little bit overgrown, maybe we've lost a little bit of vision, and maybe we've lost a little bit of motivation to be involved in church. Maybe we're just not sure how or where to start to kind of bring back some order. Well, in a time like this, I think it's really important to remind ourselves of the vision, of why we gather together, of who we are as God's people, and of why we do all the things that we do, whether they're our services, whether they're our life groups, whether they're our op shop, or our children and young people's ministry, or running Alpha courses, or all the many things that go on in the life of this church. Because all of those things are not actually about us, but they're about Jesus, and each one of us is called by Jesus to follow him. And the call to follow him means we're called to learn from him, to become like him, and to be involved in what he is doing in this world, which is about bringing the kingdom of God. And the amazing thing is that Jesus chooses to bring the kingdom through his church, through his people. And so each one of us has a role to play in the church. But if we don't hold on to the vision of who Jesus is and who we are as followers of him, then we quickly will start to lose motivation to play our part in the church community. And I think it's really easy to lose sight of the vision, given all the difficulties that we've had in these past two years. So our vision statement as a church is to make Jesus known and see lives transformed. That's behind everything that we do. And each person who is part of our church is called to be involved in that. That's not just the job of a few people. But each one of us is a part of our call to follow Jesus, is called to offer our time and our gifts to serve one another in this church community so that we can all grow in the knowledge of who God is and we can all become like Jesus. 
And then as a body, we will be effective in bringing about the kingdom in this world. So God can use each one of us, and he wants to use each one of us. We don't need any special qualifications to follow Jesus. We don't need any special qualifications to be used by God. All Jesus is looking for is a willing heart. He's looking for a heart that will respond to his call, to follow him with obedience, with humility, and in surrender. And I think that's what we see in the reading we had from Luke um, in Simon Peter's response to Jesus. So that's what I'm going to have a little, spend a little bit of time looking at. Um, just to bring you up to speed, we're in a series called Face to Face, um, where we've been, as a church, we've been looking at these encounters of Jesus, um, the encounters he's had with different people in Scripture and the um, impact that those encounters have had on ordinary people's lives, how that's basically those encounters have transformed their lives. So we've been looking at that and we've been focusing on the fact that Jesus also wants to encounter us today and wants to transform our lives as well. So that's that's kind of the background to why we're looking at this encounter that Jesus has with Simon Peter and and the reading from uh, the reading from Luke's gospel today. So as I read through this um, passage during the week, I was just so struck by Simon Peter's response to Jesus and the way that he demonstrated a willing heart. I saw that he demonstrated a willingness to act on the instructions of Jesus, to obey Jesus. He was willing to bow down before Jesus in humility and acknowledge that he needed God. And he was willing to leave everything he's known to follow Jesus, put Jesus first in his life. And it's because Simon Peter responds the way that he does His life is completely transformed by this encounter with Jesus. Simon Peter goes on to become one of the 12 disciples that follow Jesus, and he actually becomes one of the key leaders in the early church. So in the book of Acts, we see Peter as being one of those key leaders um, when the church is established after Jesus' resurrection. So let's spend some time looking at his response. And the first thing, Simon Peter shows us is that he was willing to act on the instruction of Jesus. At the beginning of the gospel reading, Jesus is sitting on the fishing boats teaching the crowds. And when he finishes teaching, he says to Simon, put out into deep water and let your nets down for a catch. Now Simon Peter is a fisherman. That's his vocation. And so he knows um, what he's doing. And he knows that the conditions are not right for fishing. First of all, um, night time was generally the time that fishermen went fishing. That was generally the best time to fish. And Simon Peter and his mates have actually just been out fishing all night, and they haven't caught anything. And then here comes Jesus, who's not a fisherman. He's a carpenter's son. He's a preacher. And he's telling Simon Peter that it's time to go out fishing, in the middle of the day. It just doesn't make any sense. But Simon Peter doesn't respond by saying, no, what are you talking about? I know what I'm doing. Instead, his response is really surprising. He says, Master, we've worked hard all night, but we haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Simon Peter is willing to obey Jesus and follow his instructions, even though... They don't make any sense. So I I thought a little bit about why Simon Peter responded like that. And if we look back in chapter 4 of Luke's Gospel, um, we see that this is not actually the first moment that Simon Peter's had any encounter with Jesus. Prior to this event um, on the fishing boat, Jesus has been in the synagogue, he's been teaching, he's actually driven out some impure spirits, he's um, healed some people, and we, we even read that, Simon, that Jesus has stayed with Simon in his, Simon's home. So Simon has already started to, um, to hear and to see what Jesus is doing, and um, I think that Simon has already realised that Jesus is speaking with some sort of authority, that his instructions are worth listening to. So when he's asked to let down his nets in the middle of the day, he doesn't ignore that instruction. But instead he responds with a willingness 
to listen to, and to act on the words of Jesus. He trusts in the instructions of Jesus more than he trusts in his own expertise or in his own experience. And I wonder how willing we are to listen to and obey the instructions of Jesus. Do we really trust that Jesus knows better than we do? Do we really trust that his way is the way that leads to eternal life? Do we really trust that Jesus is actually still speaking to us? And are we willing to follow his instructions even when they don't make any sense to us? Or even when they go against the grain of our culture or our customs or our common wisdom? Even when we think we know better. I think Simon Peter demonstrates to us a willingness to be obedient and trust in the words of Jesus. And these last two years have thrown us all into situations where we don't know what we're doing. We don't always know the way ahead or what tomorrow is going to look like. But what we do know is we do know Jesus. And we know that he is trustworthy and we know that he knows the way ahead. So as followers of Jesus, we can trust his word and know that he will show us the way to go or the things to do or the things to say. All we need to do is be willing to listen to his voice and to act on what he says. The second thing I noticed about Simon Peter's response to Jesus was that he was willing to bow down before Jesus in humility. So as Simon Peter followed the instructions Jesus gave him, he went out into deep water and let down his net and then this boat is filled with fish. So many fish that they have to call another boat and then both boats are so full that they begin to sink. And Simon Peter and his companions are absolutely astonished. And Simon Peter's response to Jesus is to fall down, to fall down before him and to say, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Kind of seems like a strange response. But I think in that moment, Simon Peter realized the significance of who Jesus is. He encountered the holiness of Jesus. And when he did, he realized just how unholy he was. It's kind of like when we buy a new white t-shirt or a new white pair of short uh, shoes and um, we bring them home and we maybe look at the old white t-shirt that we had and we realize just how unwhite it is. I don't know if you've had that experience but um, I have and I think when we encounter the, the holiness or the majesty of God and we just see him in all his glory we realize just how dirty and unworthy we are. And I think in his response, Simon Peter is saying, well, surely a man of God, Jesus, would want nothing to do with a sinner like me. But what Simon Peter doesn't realize is that in that response of admitting his inability and confessing his sin, he's actually displaying the exact prerequisite that he needed to be used by God. God could use Simon Peter because Simon Peter knew that he needed God. Peter understood that he brought nothing to the table except what God could direct. And rather than making him rather than that making him unworthy, that acknowledging his sinful state and bowing before Jesus in humility was actually what qualified him for God's service. We also see that in the reading from Isaiah, which we had also This is the account of when Isaiah is commissioned as a prophet to God's people. And he has this vision of the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, with seraphim um, calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And Isaiah's response to seeing this vision of the Lord is to cry out, Woe to me, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And instead of being cast from the Lord's presence, um, a seraphim flies to Isaiah and touches his lips with these hot coals and says, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. The cry of humility is what qualified him or made him ready 
um, for then what he was commissioned to do, which was to be God's mouthpiece to the people of Israel. So that's the starting point to being used by God. I think often we can look at the broken parts of our lives, our weaknesses, our inabilities, our fears, our insecurities, and we can think, well, there's no way that God can use me. I'm no good. I haven't got it all together. I'm, I've stuffed up. I'm not qualified. I bring nothing to the table. But actually, understanding our brokenness and acknowledging our deep need for God is precisely what God can work with. When we come before the Lord in humility and acknowledge who we are before him, that's the starting place for serving him. We are qualified to serve him not because of anything that we bring to the table, but simply because of the call of Jesus. It is Jesus that qualifies us for the task of doing God's work. That means that each one of us is qualified. We are needed by God. God can use you. So Simon Peter demonstrates to us a willingness to confess his sin and bow down before Jesus in humility. I was also struck by Simon Peter's willingness to leave everything to follow Jesus. So after he's bowed down before him in in humility, Jesus says to him, don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. Jesus calls Simon Peter to something bigger. He calls him to be one of his disciples, to learn from him and to be part of the work that he's doing. And Simon Peter leaves everything and follows him. It's just an amazing willingness to go. Simon and his companions have just caught the greatest catch of fish in their lives. Their boats are completely full, and yet they leave that at the seashore, and they go and they follow Jesus. Not only that, they're fishermen. This is what they do for work. This is their vocation. This is what they know. This is their source of income. And yet they willingly leave that behind in order to be part of a greater vision that Jesus has called them to. Peter understood that there was no greater call than the call to follow Jesus and to fish for people in his kingdom. So there's a massive priority shift that takes place for Simon Peter. And he leaves behind his vocation and all that he's known to follow where Jesus calls. And I wonder how willing we are to leave things behind to follow Jesus. Whether that's unhealthy habits in our lives or things that distract us from God, or whether it's things that bring us some comfort and security in our lives but actually hold us back from going where where Jesus is calling us. Are we willing to leave those things behind and let God's work come first in our lives? Or is doing God's work just something we try and fit around all the other things that are going on in our lives? Now, I don't think this means we all have to, uh, you all have to leave your vocations and enter full-time ministry. Some people are called to that. But I do think there is a call for all of us to be prepared to go wherever Jesus is calling us and to do whatever Jesus is asking us to do, no matter what it might mean we leave behind. Um, The challenge is, what is going to take first priority in our lives? And Simon Peter demonstrates to us a willingness to leave everything behind and put Jesus first in his life. So if we come back to the garden, here we are. Um, Towards the end of last year, before I moved from St. John's College, I noticed that there were a couple of people who did try and start working to bring back some order to this garden. And one Saturday morning they got together, um, I think there was about three of them, and they started to do some weeding in the garden. And of course I lived over this, next to this garden, so I saw them there and I was going out, went out, came back a few hours later and I um, looked at the work that they'd done, and they'd done some really good work. They'd made, but they'd only made this kind of small dent in a massive garden that had so much work to do. And I just thought, oh, I hope that that work or the weeds and everything don't all grow back um, before someone else next comes to do something in that garden. 
And I think what was really needed in that garden was everybody from the college community to come together and to um, all play their part in bringing back that garden into order. We couldn't just rely on a couple of people from the community to do the work. And I think that's the same for us in the church. We've been through a really tough season. We still are in a tough season. But we're trying to rebuild and to figure out how to faithfully follow Jesus and be his church in this time and this place. And we're only going to be effective in that if we all play our part in it. We can't just rely on a few people to do the work. But there are so many ways that we can all get involved in that, whether we're whether it's um, volunteering at our services or in our different ministry areas or um, getting involved in the op shop or um, in our online meetings, our prayer meetings, our coffee meetings, our life groups. Um, We have a massive community and there's a lot of places and opportunities to, to serve. But we need everybody to play their part. And of course, church life is going to look different to what it has before. And maybe the things that we're involved in might look different to what they were before. But as followers of Jesus, we can trust his voice and trust his instructions. So I think the challenge for us is to look to Jesus, to willingly offer ourselves to be used by him, and to willingly place his work as the first priority in our lives. And I think as we do that, we'll be surprised by what God can do in us, and through us as his people in this place at St. Margaret's. So may we each have willing hearts to acknowledge our deep need for God and to obey his word and to lay down all that we have in order to follow where he leads. Shall we pray? Jesus, we thank you for your call. We thank you that you call each one of us to follow you and that we don't need any special qualifications, um, but all you're looking for is a willing heart. And so, um, Jesus, I pray that you would help us to respond with willing hearts, to respond in obedience, to respond in humility, and to lay down the things that hold us back from following you. And Jesus, we pray that your work would be achieved in us and through us as we turn to you with willing hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.